Cool. All right. If nobody's opposed, I'm going to get started. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Today we'll be talking about <coughs> eye movements. Elementary eye movements at that. So easy, you say. Not so fast. <laughs> This is a tribute to the late great Richard Feynman. Uh, when he would give elementary lectures, he would mean that it, it's not easy. It's just very little is required ahead of time in order to understand it, except, of course, for an infinite amount of intelligence. So I promise you won't need an infinite amount of intelligence today, just a lot. But um, you know, let's get started. Eye movements can be intimidating, even to a skilled neurologist. Why is this, and why is learning eye movement so intimidating? Well, I have some ideas. We learn eye movements from written or spoken language, and if we're lucky, we learn with a two-dimensional representation of reality, and then it's on us to reconstruct a very complicated three-dimensional map of the physical world, and that is difficult to do. It's cognitively burdensome, so much so that it scares a lot of people away from even trying to sit down and learn these. Reason number two, even if I show you videos, even high quality videos of pathologic eye movements, if you don't know what you're looking for, it's going to be very difficult to understand. Um, and as a learner, if you can't understand something without already knowing the pattern that you're trying to see, what's the point? But fear not, I am going to help you today. I am going to help you build a better three-dimensional conceptual framework of what's actually happening to the eyes. And I'm going to give you some simplified and idealized examples of some eye movements so that you can start to build a better pattern recognition machine. And we are going to make this as fundamental as possible. How am I going to do this? Well, I have developed a series of animations that I affectionately refer to as iRobot. <laughs> so not, not that iRobot, this iRobot. Um, this is meme one of two, if you're counting. Uh, but let's get started. So having an eye is good. Having an eye that moves is better. So the first task evolution was faced with is designing a structure that can actually move this spheroid in our orbits. And the first task that we have is figuring out how to understand and how to describe this. But where do we begin? Again, this is elementary. We're going to begin in the simplest place possible with a sphere. This sphere is entirely unconstrained. It can move wherever it wants. Uh, and any point it occupies in space, it can occupy any particular rotational orientation at once. Uh, that's complicated. Fortunately, we don't have to keep track of all that. And that's not really how the eye works. So if we want to think about a better, uh, a better conceptualization of the eye, we can think that it's, it's really locked into place by the orbital cavity. There's soft tissue around it, and around that soft tissue, there's bone. So the eye can't translate throughout space, but it can still rotate freely. And it can occupy any rotational orientation it so desires, at least for now. And that's still very complicated, so we need a better way of thinking of this. And if you have a sphere, with a central point of rotation. It can rotate in any orientation at once. But you can conceptualize that rotation as any particular rotation is the equivalent to placing some imaginary axis that runs through the center of the eye, and then you rotate the sphere around that axis. So we have this orange axis. That, that's a lot of words I said, but let's see what it looks like. We can move this around, position it however we want. When we're satisfied with what we have done, we can stop and we can rotate the sphere around that axis. So any particular movement you could think of can be conceptualized in this way. But we haven't really solved any problems because we still have an infinite amount of imaginary axes that this sphere could rotate around. But we've made an important point that we can conceptualize this as rotation around an axis. Once we do that, we can say, OK, we have three-dimensional space. We can create three perpendicular axes. And then one single movement can be summarized by component movements around each one of these axes. And that looks like this. This is the movement to begin with. This is the movement stepwise around the red, the green, and the blue axis, which gets us to the exact same spot. So it's just a mathematical proof, and it's a very simple one. but it's going to be very important. 
because we are able to position this set of axes however we desire, and it'll still be mathematically valid. So we're going to do so in a way that's convenient for us. And surprise, the sphere was the eye the whole time. And surprise, these axes that we're interested in are going to be oriented the same way that we think of the rest of anatomical space. So we have an anterior to posterior axis, we have a medial to lateral axis, and we have a superior to inferior axis, uh, oriented just like this. And what this allows us to do, it allows us to think about the movements of the eye, and it also allows us to develop a language that we can use to explain and describe the movements of the eye. And we've done just that. So these are not eyes, these are airplanes. But if you picture yourself in the cockpit of this airplane, looking down the nose, then the nose becomes equivalent to the pupil. So the nose of an airplane moves up, that's called pitch. With the eyes, that's called a vertical duction. Um, so you can have supraduction or infraduction. If the nose of your airplane moves left and right, that's called yaw. And in, in the world of eyes, this is a horizontal duction. So abduction, adduction, which is the same as lateral and medial rotation. And if this airplane does a barrel roll, then the nose doesn't actually change position, it just changes orientation. With the eyeballs, that's called torsion. And that's the language we're going to use to describe everything we see that's happening to the eyes. And the first reason this will be important is because we can describe and predict all of the actions of the six individual muscles that control eye rotation. And some of them are easy. So let's start with the medial rectus and the lateral rectus. It starts on the side of the eye, pulls directly backward, and you can imagine it rotating the eye around this orange axis, and it just so happens that, that orange axis is perfectly aligned with the z-axis we've just created, superior to inferior. So all it does is move the pupil to the left or to the right. And here's me showing off my eyeball models and my biceps. Um, and there are some models if anybody wants to play along at home, but this is a very simple system and it's a very easily described system. It does get more complicated after the medial and lateral rectus. Uh, None of the other muscles are in a straight line to any of our axes of interest. So let's take the superior rectus. It inserts at a 23 degree angle with respect to the line of sight. Um, so it'll rotate the eye around this orange axis, which as you know doesn't align with any of the axes we would want it to, so it does a more complicated movement. We can break down this line of force into its vector components though, and we can align those vector components however we want. So this largest force vector is going to pull the top of the eye toward the back of the head. That creates supraduction or elevation of the pupil. And this smaller force vector pulls the top of the eye toward the nose. That's an intorsion. And it also pulls the front of the eye toward the nose. That's a medial rotation. And that's what that complete movement looks like. We need all three planes to describe that action. We can also break it down into intorsion, supraduction, and medial rotation, and we get to the same spot. So this is what we're doing when we're describing muscle actions in this way. We're breaking down their component actions. Again, wow, incredible, <laughs> it works. The, the obliques are next. Um, again, I, I skipped the inferior rectus. It's the same orientation as the superior rectus, just on the other side of the eye. So if you want a homework assignment, think to yourself about what it'll do. On to the obliques. So this is the superior oblique. It originates at the apex, the orbital apex, like many of the others, but it wraps around this trochlea. And because it wraps around this pulley system, the line of force goes from the insertion to the trochlea. And it's a little counterintuitive to think about. Um, the origin, the functional origin, is in front of the eye, and the insertion is behind the eye. So you have to twist your mind to be able to interpret that. Anyway, this is the line of force. This is the axis that uh, rotation will take. Not well aligned, so let's break it down into vectors. This dominant vector will pull the top of the eye toward the nose, in torsion. This secondary vector will pull the top of the eye forward and depress the pupil, in production. And you also get a little bit of the back of the eye coming toward the nose, which creates lateral rotation. That's what it does. This is what its components are made of. 
So there, there's a lot of ways to think about this, and there's one uh, standardized, agreed upon language to describe our ultimate outcome of these muscles. Um, yeah, yeah, here's me again. <laughs> and product placement, that's what that's called. <laughs> so I could have shown you this slide and saved myself 15 minutes, but that's boring. And now you understand where this information comes from. And I do think there's value into actually understanding things rather than just looking at charts and trying to memorize them. And I would hope that if I whited out this entire chart and just gave you a model of the eye, you could very easily and fluently understand what the muscles will do and describe them to somebody else, because you're a teacher as well. Anyway, that was with the eye in primary gaze. And as you know, once you start moving the eye, you actually change all of these insertion angles. So let's take the, the right eye and the superior rectus. Let's deviate the eye laterally, rotate the eye laterally, and see what happens to the force vectors and see how they change their alignment relative to our axes of interest. Incredible. So we rotate the eye 23 degrees laterally, and wow, the entire line of force is perfectly aligned with the line of sight. The axis of rotation is now perfectly aligned with the medial lateral axis of the eye, and it will create a pure superduction. Unbelievable. Uh, I say pure, it's, they're, they're, it's not quite this simple. There are other things to consider. Um, but this is a good approximation, and you can use this approximation. If we want to align the oblique muscles so that they're dominant in vertical duction, we would have to rotate the eye medially. Here's what that looks like. Wow, almost there. So physiologically, we can't quite align the oblique muscles with the line of sight, but we can still get close and we can bring this dominant force vector so that the predominant component action moves the pupil either up or down, in production, superduction. Uh, you can play along if you'd like. See how moving the eye changes your insertion angles. Anyway, there's got to be a way that we can use this. It has to be useful in some way for me to be talking about it. And we're neurologists, so just like we isolate muscles of the extremities when we test their strength, we try to isolate muscles of the eye to see if they're working. So standard left gaze is the left lateral rectus, right medial rectus, easy. But if we want to isolate either the <coughs> obliques or the superior inferior recti, we first need to bring the eye into some kind of uh, lateral gaze. And then we can think about, well, which muscle did that just bring into alignment with the line of sight? What will be the dominant muscle controlling uh, this action? And same thing on inferior gaze. It's really quite simple. And again, I could have showed you a chart and saved a lot of time, but that is so incredibly boring. And there is so much value and so much intellectual pleasure into just understanding things, understanding things well, Alyssa. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Alyssa agrees, everybody. Um, so that's great. Now you understand this. Now you can explain this to other people. Uh, if you want to do a pure vertical movement, it's more complicated. No single muscle can do that well. So you pull on the superior rectus. It intorts the eye and immediately rotates the eye. So you compensate with the inferior oblique. Beautiful. I don't know. Shout out to this uh, random guy on the internet who shoved some laser beams into these eyeball models. Brilliant idea. Really, really great. Moving on. So why do we care about muscles being weak? Well, we care about localizing. And usually weak muscles imply weak nerves or some other lesion along the nervous system. And you guys know these. I will just put them up here. But each of these muscles has a corresponding nerve that sends it information. And we use our knowledge of all this to figure out where and what the deficit is. So what do you notice here? Anything? Anything out of the ordinary? Yes. So this right eye is too far in, and I've added this little flashlight reflection. So you can see the, the flashlight is on the lateral side of this pupil and the medial side of this pupil. So there is a problem. You can do this with your pen light. Just shine it at people's eyes and see if the reflection is equal. So we stress our muscles and see what happens. And oh lord, that looks so bad. <laughs> so this is a very obvious example, but you get the point. You try to stress the muscle and you see what position your abnormality is most significant in. Uh, and there's a lot of subtlety to this. 
So sometimes it's just manifested by a saccade with decreased velocity. Um, but you now know the information you need to figure things out. How about now? Either the right pupil is elevated or the left pupil is depressed. Well, let's swing the eyes around and see what happens. Okay, what's the problem? <clears throat> Yes, think. Think about what you've brought into alignment in that position. Audience, anyone? Looks like the right eye doesn't go down enough, but it seems like it's Yes, yes. What muscle have you isolated? It's one of the obliques, yeah. It's a superior oblique, which brings the back of the eye forward, which depresses the pupil. So now you've seen a problem that's only manifest in medial gaze, and it helps you isolate a muscle. So that's oblique, um, superior oblique of fourth nerve. Oops. Didn't mean to do that. Everybody knows this one. Classic third. Uh, the, the third innervates all the muscles except the lateral rectus, which, when left unopposed, will bring the eye outward and the superior oblique, which unopposed, will intort the eye and depress it slightly. Plus you get a blown pupil because the third has parasympathetic inputs. Uh, but that could be a lecture in its own right. Uh, let's see what happens here. Ooh, oof. Ooh. Could, be, could, be a, could be a right medial rectus. Oops. It's definitely an isolated right medial rectus. It very well could be an isolated right medial rectus. That wouldn't be an entirety of a nerve going down, but the, no, this is something else. This is something we realize. We can prove it's something else by having this patient converge and seeing, oh, the right medial rectus is working. So this is an INO, internuclear ophthalmoplegia. So we covered muscles, we covered nerves. Uh, nerves get their information from nuclei. The next step up is where the nuclei get their information from. And the, the prototypical problem that we solved is in lateral gaze, there's one lateral rectus and the other medial rectus that have to fire at the same time and come from different nuclei on different sides of the brain in different areas of the brainstem. So the way we solve this, we send information to six, and then six sends information to contralateral three, which yokes the eyes together, so the yoked pair. Again, internuclear control and supranuclear control could be its own lecture, and unfortunately, I'm just going to skip it. So we've moved the eye. Are we satisfied with moving the eye? We have such a wonderful understanding of how this works and how to describe what we're seeing. So let's move on. Uh, an eye is good, an eye that moves is better, but a body is good and a body that moves is better. Um, and we have this big head that moves all the time and just drags the eyes with it because they're locked into place. So were we not able to compensate, that would be a very confusing visual environment. So let's talk about that. If we rotate our heads to the left, we need to turn our eyes to the right. And this needs to happen in a one-to-one -one ratio, a gain of one. Uh, technically a gain of negative one, depending on how you think of it. Um, but you get the idea. Every degree of rotation needs to be compensated for in lateral gaze and vertical gaze. There is torsional compensation, but again, a purely torsional movement doesn't actually bring the pupil off target, so it doesn't bring the fovea off target. So the brain cares about it less, and it's incomplete. In this example, there's 45 degrees of head roll, and there's only 5 degrees of ocular counter roll. But we'll get to that later. How do we do this? Uh, at least for rotational accelerations, we use the semicircular canals within the vestibular system. And these are also very interesting and very mathematically elegant. So we have three canals. They are oriented as such. They operate in pairs, so the right lateral canal is approximately in the same plane, this blue plane, as the left lateral canal. The right posterior canal is in approximately the same plane as the left anterior canal, as you can also see here, we're looking directly at this plane. So they operate in pairs, and the, the lateral canal is, the plane is approximately in the horizontal plane, which is good for us, convenient for us, that's easy to describe. 
but the other two are neither in the sagittal plane nor in the coronal plane nor in the axial plane which again mathematically that's not a problem we have three axes that are oriented approximately perpendicularly to each other we can do plenty of calculations with that the brain has no trouble we conceptually have a little bit of trouble because now we have a difficult time describing exactly what something like the posterior canal will do but fear not i will help you first let's actually think about how these work though because the mechanism is, is pretty cool so something called inertia an object at rest will stay at rest until acted on by another force property of matter it's a property of <laughs> ryan says it's a property of matter bill nye taught him that, bill nye taught him that. Yeah. anyway there is there is useful information when there is rotation within one of these planes so if you rotate purely within the horizontal plane you send useful information to the horizontal canals and think about it this way you have tubes you have fluid in the tubes if you're in the plane you can move the tube around the fluid so the fluid stays in place attached to the tube is a little hair cell so you move the tube the hair cell moves with it. The fluid is stationary, so stationary fluid against a moving piece of hair creates drag, and that drag bends the hair. And that bending of the hair supplies the raw data that the nervous system uses to decode these movements. And you end up getting component movements in all three of these axes, and then the brain summarizes this. It adds them all together to create a perception of one coherent movement. And it does, and it uses that to compensate uh, where the eyes are. Just beautiful. Uh, so here's what this might look like. We're in the horizontal plane. We activate one of the horizontal canals. We inhibit the other horizontal canal. Um, and that causes a compensatory eye movement. And which side gets activated and which side gets inhibited is uh, entirely arbitrary. There's no physical property that explains that, unfortunately. So you'll just need to memorize it. Uh, I've heard secondhand that Doug says that the semicircular canals are selfish, and if you move toward it, you activate it. If you move away from it, you depress it or disappoint it. So remember it however you want. But leftward head rotation, activate the left horizontal canal, cause the eyes to move back to the right. In the same vein, if you activate the left uh, horizontal canal, you're telling the brain that the head is moving to the, to the left, toward it and that the eyes should move in the opposite direction. Again, that's the easy one. Um, how about the, let's isolate the right posterior canal. Let's try to activate it. So here's right posterior. Here it is uh, looking directly at it. If we move in this direction, we get kind of this complicated compensatory eye movement, which keeps the eyes on target. And understanding the position of the eyes and what this posterior canal does is going to be valuable. So try to position it, or try to have a mental representation of it. If you'll humor me, you can pick a spot somewhere, fixate on it, and move your head like this. Bring your right ear to your right shoulder and your chin to the ceiling. Keep looking at that spot and just feel what happens to your eyes. If your chin's to the ceiling, you need to bring the pupil down toward the lower lid. So that's the, the obvious one. Uh, the one that you can't feel is the torsional compensation, but it, it goes the opposite way that your head is rolling. Again, it'll be important. So the semicircular canals compensate for rotational acceleration with that lovely inertial mechanism. The ones we didn't discuss are the, the otolith organs, the ones with the little stones in them. And these compensate for linear accelerations, <clears throat> most notably due to gravity. So these stones are just pulled downward by gravity, and they help you keep a perception of Earth vertical along with many other things but I don't have time to talk much about them. Okay, I'm gonna give you an eye movement without any context. If you're brave, you can try to explain it. <clears throat> well, there's small vertical movements. Um, it almost looks like this fast pace was up. Richard says, almost looks like the fast phase was up. Okay, the, so... Whoever was holding the camera, though, that was pretty shaky. It was shaky, yeah. So <laughs> so I think I think they obviously have Parkinson's. A disease, yes. yes. <laughs> they are not well. They should see a neurologist. 
so we we're not we're not diagnosing the cameraman. We're diagnosing the patient. Um, so describe this. Does this look like any particular pattern to you? Can you describe the movements? There looks like a torsional component. Looks like uh, we we've identified nystagmus. There there are beats. There's jerking. Um, so nystagmus is defined by a slow phase. That is the pathology. And then typically, because you realize that slow phase is pathologic, either consciously or unconsciously, you make a saccade back to where you think you should be looking. So the slow phase is some pathologic reflex that's pulling you away from where you should be looking. You realize it, and you have a fast phase that beats back toward the target. And that's important. Anyway, the point I'm making, uh, you, you see an eye movement like this, and even if this is like a textbook eye movement, the, the cameraman wasn't very good, according to Richard, and um, maybe the video was a little grainy and the refresh rate wasn't great. So uh, if you really know what you're looking for, you, you would have seen it. Um, so let me show you what you might be looking for. So let's talk about BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. This is the disorder when one of those stones from the otolith organs makes its way into the semicircular canals, runs into one of those hair cells, sends information to the brain that shouldn't be there about rotational acceleration, and the patient gets a paroxysm of dizziness that resolves after several seconds usually. So this is the pro position dependent too, right? Yes. That's like really important. Very important. So this is the prototypical hyperactivity disorder of a semicircular canal. Trivia, does anybody know which canal is most commonly affected? <coughs> Posterior. Posterior. Posterior canal by far is most commonly affected. And what's the maneuver we use to activate the posterior canal? The Dick's Hall Pike. I can remember what it was. The Dick's Hall Pike. Okay. And all this is is a fancy maneuver to put the posterior canal into a gravitationally dependent position so that a stone can trickle down into it. Hey, it looks kind of like that movement you said to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the movement I said to do. So I'm sorry, when you when you're showing this, you should make a little device where you put someone's head in and you just like compensate and then make like little quick jerks. It's gonna greatly increase the rate that we um, diagnose like uh, semicircular canal problems. No it's also gonna get iatrogenic um, dissection. Cool. Thanks, Richard. How about that? <laughs> um, I think that would be like a terrific some, idea. Somebody That's write down that million dollar idea. I'm busy giving a presentation. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, back to me. <laughs> All right, focus on the posterior canal. So we turn the head 45 degrees to the right, and then we drop it back 90 degrees at least. And look at this. We bring this posterior canal into a perfectly gravitationally dependent position, and a stone trickles on in and activates the canal. Uh, there is a lag. This is something that used to confuse me. I thought I was thinking stone, so I would think you drop a rock on the ground. It happens very fast. Uh, the consistency of that fluid is kind of like mineral oil, and the stones are very small and light. So the mechanics is a little bit more like dropping fish flakes into a fish tank. They just trickle down. So leave the patient in here for at least 30 seconds to get a valid exam. Um, but anyway, so we should be able to predict what happens to the eyes if we know which canal we're activating, right? So that position I had you go into, where your eyes were dragged down and torsional away from the rotation, that's your slow phase. That's the pathologic reflex activation. You compensate for that by beating in the opposite direction. Oh, look at this. Meme number two. OK, anyway, <laughs> point is, somebody calls you. They say, oh, I did a Dick's Hall Pike, and it, it made them dizzy. So they have BPPV, right? And you say, not so fast, tiny brain. <laughs> oh my god. That's yeah. not what we look for. We, we, big brain, politely tell them that we're looking for a provocation of nystagmus. But after today, you'll be galaxy brain, and you'll say, oh, no, no, no. We look for a very specific pattern of nystagmus. OK. <laughs> this is, uh, is going to be slow motion. So we, we drop the patient into Dick's Hall Pike. There's a lag. We activate the posterior <laughs> canal. And then we watch what happens. So we have torsional beating toward the excited canal and vertical beating upward. Remember, the beat is the opposite of the pathology. It's the correction for the pathology. Typically, we're looking at the patient upside down. So it's for fun. 
drop them in. Yeah, that's a, it downward be ear is activated. And again, this is up beating from patient perspective. <laughs> Torsion beating toward the downward ear. <laughs> this, is, this is nightmare fuel. Okay, full speed. Dick's Hall Pike. Lag. And then here's here's the subtle activation. And this is a, a textbook example. This is better than textbook. This is this is too good to be true. Literally. Okay. Alright, that's your pattern of nice segments. So again, we're gonna look at these eyes. Um, the same, the same video as before, and we're gonna say we just <coughs> drop this person into a, a right ear down, uh, Dick's Hall Pike. So we expect up beating torsional toward the excited canal. So up beating and rightward torsional. And if we're the examiner and we know what to expect, we can see it. Hopefully, yeah. I think I can see it. Uh, or you can imagine it. <laughs> it's not really strange, but it's rotating. Yeah, it's still tough. But yeah, so if if you're gonna if you're gonna look for if you're gonna try to recognize a pattern that maybe isn't great, then you you really need to know what you're looking for. And the yeah, yeah be a better be a better photographer. Anyway, the point is you can you can very neatly geometrically explain the the peripheral vestibular system, which gives you a lot of predictive value on what you expect to find on your exams. Um, there's no reason you can't affect the anterior horizontal canal. You would need a different maneuver to isolate those, and you would have a different pattern of nystagmus. But you can perfectly anticipate that pattern by understanding how these canals are oriented, which is fantastic. You should feel enlightened at this point. Okay, pathology number two, vestibular neuritis, the prototypical hypoactivation of a vestibular system. <coughs> so you think of a balancing act um, there's two ways to have imbalance, too much weight on one side or not enough weight on the other side, which functionally gets you to the same place. So you totally take out the right side, so there's unopposed activity from the left. So this is the equivalent, a right side that's broken is the equivalent of a left side that's overactive. So the brain thinks the head is turning toward the healthy side, which draws the eyes toward the opposite side. So that's your slow phase. And then you know, you're know you awake, you correct for this, and it causes nystagmus. Um, interestingly, um, the, the pathology is, is typically isolated at the horizontal plane, which is its own question. Why does that happen? We're taking out all three canals plus the otolith organs. Um, if you think about a, a vertical movement, chin down or chin up, <coughs> you're activating, in this case, chin down. You're activating the anterior canal, and you're inhibiting the posterior canal. Uh, but on the same side. So if you take out that entire side, you're eliminating uh, equal parts activation and inhibition, which probably isn't the full story, but it's part of the story of why you don't see vertical pathology. If you do see vertical pathology, you know, vertical nystagmus, vertical misalignment, then you can't really explain that very well with this type of lesion, and you should look elsewhere in the central nervous system. Uh, we'll have a torsional. You can get torsional pathology, my, my explanation for this, why, why you don't see it often, uh, the, the gain, the amount you compensate for torsion is much lower. So I like to think it's hiding in there and you just don't pick up on it because there's so much more obvious horizontal pathology. But you can get torsional pathology. Anyway, here's your pattern of nystagmus. Slow phase toward the disease canal, fast phase away. When you look toward the slow phase, nystagmus goes away. It's called Alexander's Law true of peripheral lesions, it can be true of central lesions as well. I like to think of this, you're, you're bringing the eyes where they want to go, so there's no reason to have nystagmus, or where the brain is telling them to go. The further away from the slow phase you get, you look toward the fast phase, you're further away from where this is telling the eyes to go, so you get more nystagmus. Uh, okay, let's analyze this. Ryan saw something. What'd you see? Like yeah, uh, turning the head which side? And she was turning to her right. Yeah, so which canal is diseased? Oh, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Ryan. Okay, so yes, there was a, a subtle catch up saccade there. So if you didn't see it, don't worry. We'll show it again. But it, when you do a head impulse, you have them fixate on something, you whip their head around, 
Um, if you're going toward the healthy canal, there's no problem. That, that activation works, so they compensate. When you go toward the disease canal, it doesn't work. So that's healthy side, no problem. Stay fixated, perfect compensation. Disease side, you have the ketchup saccade. The eyes are taken with the head. After a short amount of time, the patient realizes, compensates, which is called a ketchup saccade. So see if you can see it this time. This is the healthy side, that's perfect. <coughs> That was the Z side, small ketchup saccade. Oh, yeah, it's wow. you can and see now we'll go slow second. motion. Yeah, this turn it's it's a good one. slow motion one. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Again, <laughs> the idea is with <laughs> peripheral pathology, you should know what you're looking for. So when even if you see it subtly, you should you should have an expectation <clears throat> of what you're seeing. Yeah, what if you have a both sides? That would be unfortunate. <laughs> you'd, be in a, you'd be in a world of trouble if you had this on both sides. Anyway, you've probably seen this before, um, hints exam. So again, the point here is that everything on your exam, if you're thinking of a peripheral problem, should be neatly explained by these geometric relationships. And anything that falls outside of those is almost by definition not likely to be a peripheral problem. And um, again, I could have shown you a chart like this, but that's, that's just no fun. And now you have such a great conceptual grasp of this that you're going to have a lot of predictive power when you go evaluate a dizzy patient. And when things don't line up with a peripheral pathology, you'll know. And when they do line up with a peripheral pathology, you'll know. Mm -hmm. But again, in summary, uh, bidirectional is bad. That wouldn't happen with a fixed peripheral lesion if the direction of nystagmus changes. Anything vertical is bad. That doesn't tend to happen. And then you have a test of skew, uh, which is vertical misalignment of the eyes. OK. <coughs> Uh, I will come back to that if I have time. Uh, okay, we've compensated for head movements. Are we satisfied? Ryan is satisfied. We're satisfied. We've done a lot of conceptualizing. We have a we understand this very well. Those are the the fundamentals of eye movements. Those neatly align with the geometries of the peripheral ocular motor system and the peripheral vestibular system. And if we grasp that, we have a lot of predictive power over what we should and shouldn't see with those types of lesions. So that's all great. Um, but we've been ignoring some important things. Um, we've ignored, actually, why eye movements are useful, because they bring a target of interest in alignment with our fovea. Uh, we do that with a saccade. Well, it turns out saccades are very complicated. Once we saccade to a target, we fixate on it if we have useful information to gain from it. Fixation itself is very complicated. Um, as soon as we move the eyes away from primary position, uh, all of the forces on the eye change. There's different elastic forces that we have to compensate for. That's complicated. And this entire process is continuously adaptive. So if there is uh, faulty information, the brain can identify it, fix itself, update its software, and uh, realign the system so that it is coherent with the reality you're experiencing. And that process is complicated. So what have we ignored so far? We have ignored the central nervous system. And we have been very conceptual so far. But once we dive into the central nervous system, we tend to quickly lose our explanatory power over things. Uh, so if, uh, if you're tired of thinking abstractly, then this is, this is the part for you. Um, We'll be doing more describing now. OK, so let's dive into the, the black box of neurology. So we'll be talking about unstable visual fixation. When you're, when you're trying to fixate on something and you're being drawn off target. So again, one way you can do that is, is abnormalities from the periphery, from the vestibular system, which create a reflex that draws you off target. Another way is just the, the fixation mechanisms themselves aren't working properly. So the first of that is saccadic intrusions. Um, you're fixated on something. Uh, an inappropriate saccade pulls you away from your target of <coughs> interest. These are, def by definition, characterized by a fast phase. So a saccade is fast. This is a fast phase diverting your gaze from your object of interest. Um, and it can be provoked by shifting your gaze around. The first we'll discuss is square wave jerks. Um, the reason it's called square wave, the jerk is fast, and then it stops abruptly, creating a right angle, a square wave. 
Uh, that's if you're plotting the movements of the eye on this graph. These are low amplitude, less than 5 degrees. They're confined to the horizontal plane. They don't cross the midline. That is, it takes you off target, you go back on target, but you don't overshoot. Uh, and there's an interval between them. They're not very visually, uh, um, they don't really result in much visual dysfunction. So if, if you do or don't know, every time you make a saccade, your visual perception is actually interrupted. You don't process that information. Otherwise, you'd have a very confusing environment that's always moving. So most of the saccadic intrusions, you're not getting visual perception. So it doesn't really distort your, your perception of your environment. It's not very symptomatic. Here's what it looks like. Very nice. Off target, on target. Interval between. No slow phase to be found. All fast movements. This is five degrees, mm -hmm. so this is as big as it can get and call it a square wave jerk. Here's real life. <clears throat> Looks pretty similar. You could identify this if you saw it, hopefully. What does it mean? Well, sometimes healthy people can have it, especially as they age. Um, as square wave jerks become more prominent or larger or more atypical, you start to think of cerebellar problems. Uh, that is the classic localization that is you know, heavily involved in control of saccades. Diseases, uh, Frederick's ataxia, MSA, PSP, Parkinson's. Um, there's, there's much more localizations. Um, typically apply to the smaller, more subtle square wave jerks. Once they get real big, you're thinking cerebellar. Next is macro saccadic oscillations. Uh, these are much higher amplitude. There's still an interval. You do cross the midline, so you overshoot when you're trying to return to the midline. And they follow this nice crescendo, decrescendo pattern. Um, Conceptually, this is actually a, an extreme form of saccadic hypermetria. So you're pulled off target, you try to get back on target, but you're hypermetric, you overshoot, and you're stuck in this cycle of overshooting and undershooting until you finally settle down and reach your target again. So that's a, a very exaggerated crescendo decrescendo pattern. But these, these movements are big, you can see them. real life. It's pretty similar. Identifiable. Okay, this, again, this is a hypermetric phenomenon, just like extremity hypermetria localizes to the cerebellum, or the pons as the pons is receiving cerebellar information. Uh, next, ocular flutter opsoclonus. These are very chaotic, very erratic, come in bursts. They're very high frequency, no interval between them, and they oscillate around the midline. Uh, on the smaller side, if they're only in the horizontal plane, it's called flutter. If they're scattered around any particular other plane, it's called opsoclonus. Um, actually, I can't get PowerPoint to have a refresh rate fast enough to, to show this well. So let me open a, a different media player. These are real fast. Um, some people can sort of do this intentionally, which is uh, inappropriately termed voluntary nystagmus. Again, it's not nystagmus, it's saccades. Uh, but some people have the power to, uh, they're, they're attempting to converge and for some reason, something happens and they just get this fluttery eye movement. So it's, it's a voluntary flutter. Uh, you can pick up on it. They're, they're trying to converge, so they, they will still have the convergence triad. So they'll actually have some pupillary constriction with it and some accommodation of the lens, which you wouldn't be able to see. But anyway, interesting. Um, here's a real life example. This one's kind of hard to see. It kind of comes with eye blinks but he's definitely making back-to-back -back fast movements in the horizontal plane. Um, next is Opsoclonus. This is just pure chaos, <coughs> very fast, going everywhere, just wild. Uh, 
Um, diagnosing so many people with yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's a good fallback. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. This looks like chaos. Must be oxyclonus. <laughs> um, but to help you, these these come in bursts, and the the bursts should be short lived, very fast activity. Definitely no slow phase to be found. Um, here is real life oxyclonus. And when he shifts his gaze, you can you can notice it a little bit. That was a good one. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, <laughs> so Opsoclonus, uh, it, it tends to, as far as differential, it tends to be more on the nefarious side. So you think of perineoplastic conditions, infectious brainstem encephalitis, real bad TBIs, um, and in children, neuroblastoma does it. Localization is the same, pons and cerebellum, where all of these saccades tend to be coordinated. Okay, back to nystagmus for a, a little different kind. So nystagmus is defined by a slow phase. It doesn't even need a fast phase. So you can have pendular nystagmus, which follows this nice, neat uh, sinusoidal pendulum pattern. You often see it in demyelinating <laughs> syndromes when there is uh, typically a heavy burden of demyelination in the pons and the cerebellum. Again, same type of place. Um, if you have a lot of pontine and cerebellar lesions and you have uh, optic neuritis, it, it seems to be even more common and perhaps some kind of mismatch between your vestibular information and your visual information has, has been um, proposed as a mechanism. Anyway, demyelinating symptoms uh, syndromes tend to be horizontal or a little bit elliptical, uh, pretty regular, uh, but they can be asymmetric. And the, the eye that has visual dysfunction tends to have more severe um, nystagmus. The other common syndr syndrome is a brainstem stroke, um, typically involving the inferior olive um, or molar raised triangle, but I think we've learned over time that it's more the inferior olive that is actually responsible for this stuff. In this case, it can be vertical and torsional, so it's kind of strange to see something like that. Um, it can also be asymmetric. Um, pendulum nystagmus is probably the most visually disabling condition that we'll talk about. Because again, uh, during a saccade, you interrupt visual information, but during back-to-back -back <coughs> slow phases, you just have a constantly moving perception of the world, which would be so how unpleasant. Is that different from ocular form How's what different? Uh, it's o it only has slow phases, yeah. It's not a, right, so there slow. are no saccades. This should be back-to-back -back slow phases. The, the transition from right to left or up to down should be gentle, um, yeah. as if it's following a pendulum. So you'll see, you'll see how they're different. Hopefully. So a smooth, slow, smooth eye movements to and fro. This would be purely horizontal. In this case, it's even between the eyes. I think this is three hertz. Anybody cares? Um, let's look at vertical. And here you can get a sense of, in the real life one, you know, j j how starkly the, the speed is different. So if, if he looks upward, we see very clearly this almost bobbing of the eyes. It's, it's clearly not a saccade. It's much too slow. And it, it's very smooth when it reverses direction. Hopefully that makes a little more sense. Just back-to-back -back slow phases as opposed to quick, chaotic, fast phases. Um, and then here's the grand finale. The, the weirdest eye movement you'll never see is <laughs> seesaw nystagmus. I mean, I, I would freak out if I saw this. This is, just so, this is so bizarre. I would, I would call somebody. I would immediately yeah. call somebody. The trove or cornblath. There's somebody, somebody help. <laughs> um, this is rare, but it, it can also happen uh, with demyelinating syndromes that cause other types of pendular nystagmus. I'll just leave this up here so we can all enjoy it. <laughs> this is just, this is the, the so pinnacle of my presentation. With it going with so much like high burden of demyelinating disease, you thought that you just like get rid of so many other pathways that you're observing some primitive reflex or something? Um, I don't know. So again, I wish I had an elegant mechanism, but I like to think of it as the, the brain is still trying to process information and it's still trying to adapt itself. Yeah. And those pathways that are involved in both processing and adapting the visual 
visual compensatory system are clearly diseased. So whatever it's trying to do is manifesting in some bizarre pattern. Um, I, that's just my explanation for why you know none of this follows like a clear peripheral pattern, and you can't explain this very well. It's just a, an inappropriate, uh, inappropriate interpretation of information and an inappropriate uh, adaptation of information. And that's that. Um, yeah, so you know some patterns now, hopefully. We're running out of time. And importantly, you know, you know geometrically uh, any possible pattern that you could expect from a peripheral lesion. And if you can confidently exclude those, then you're left with central nervous system lesions. And you can basically describe them and see if your description matches any particular pattern that you're familiar with. And hopefully this helps you do so and helps you build a pattern recognition machine so that when you see this in person, you have, you have some things to say, does it look like this? Does it look like this? Does it look like this? And you can develop your, your thought process based on that. Um, if anybody wants a brain bender, we, we, said, um, we said direction changing nystagmus is bad, right? We established that. Let's look at this. So you have your torsional beacon. It's not moving, purely horizontal. I'm going to have them look up. And suddenly, our, our torsional beacon starts moving. Are you concerned about this? Has your direction changed? No, why not? You're out of that plane now. Oh, yes. Excellent. Let's, look him, let's make him look really far up. Oh. We're, we're going to go a full 90. I'm worried that he can do that. Yeah. <laughs> he, he can do that. <laughs> so now we're, now we're purely torsional. OK, if, if you see this, really do call for yeah. help. This, is, this should not happen. <laughs> yeah, call, 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 call. Send, from the from the Send them to a different emergency department. OK, so if, if you have a peripheral pathology, um, when you move your eyes, your vestibular apparatus hasn't moved. So you, you need to keep your uh, coordinate axes fixed to the non-moving system. Uh, so you're rotating around the blue axis. You turn the eyes upwards. The skull and the vestibular system haven't moved. So you're still going to be rotating around the blue axis. So you should see a little bit of conversion from horizontal to uh, torsional as you, as you deviate from your primary <coughs> position of gaze. So I, I did see this not too long ago, and I inappropriately described it as direction changing. So now you'll know. You, it, this is allowed. And geometrically, it, it has a reason. Okay, that was my brain bender. You guys are better than I thought. So hopefully, I don't know if you learned anything, but if you, if you did, that's great. Hopefully you at least looked at things from a different perspective. <laughs> and hopefully um, you have some tools and you have some ideas to imp impart upon somebody who's naive to these, uh, to the concept of eye movements.